Big Fluff. everybody i'm joel murphy and i'm andy mcintyre and this is silver linings playback the podcast where we watch maligned movies and we find their silver linings and we are in the month of november and we are still watching movie musicals and this week we have the 1981 steve martin herbert ross collaboration pennies from heaven yeah we do because anytime it rains it rains pennies from heaven it's true. And this is our second uh, Steve Martin, Herbert Ross collaboration on the pod. As My Blue Heaven also. Which those two, they, they so those have a couple things in common. They have that, that it's a collaboration between those two. And they are also Steve Martin movies that I personally love that the world does not. <laughs> That's the other thing they have in common. <laughs> yep. It's true. And in both, I think Steve Martin falls in love with a Tony Award winning actress. Yeah, also true. Carol Kane and Bernadette Peters. And both are also sequels to uh, Goodfellas. And both have Rick Moranis. (laughs) Some of those things aren't true. I think we should just say it up front. Like some of those things that we just said aren't true. Some of them. You'll have to watch the movie to figure out which ones. Yeah. And you don't know that Rick Moranis wasn't an extra in Pennies from Heaven. That's true. We should all watch it again and find out just to be sure. Yes. But no, it's Um, it's an interesting thing to talk about this movie because you were saying this right before we started, which is you and I both enjoy this movie, but neither of us is surprised that it is maligned. And I think it's worth taking a moment before we really get into the movie itself to to set the stage for people if they don't know if you're if you're like a little Gen Z kid and you know Steve Martin as that old guy who hangs out with Selena Gomez on Only Murders in the Building like this Steve Martin the one who made this movie that we watched this is the height of his fame which is a fame you can't actually really comprehend which is A man who was, I believe, the first or at least one of the first to be filling stadiums to see stand up comedy, who was a giant megastar, who was a huge pop culture figure, who was beloved. And he had made The Jerk, which was a big, hilarious, huge comedy hit, comedy hit. He did that and then followed it up with this. And I think that's all important to remember because you have to get in that frame of mind. You can't watch it now from a modern lens. You have to watch it from the lens of someone who loves wild and crazy guy, frequent SNL host, arrow through his head, dancing around. Banjo playing barrow through his head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like he was known Like, like now we have a better sense of who he is and there's more depth to who Steve Martin gets to be. But people back then did not want depth. They wanted him to be funny. And he has an amazing memoir called Born Standing Up, where he talks about when he was at this point, which is sort of the end of his stand up career, where he really started to hate doing stand up because it was just a victory lap and everybody knew 
his punchlines and and nobody was there like it lost what's fun about doing comedy for him in that it was just people saying all the jokes with him and like so i think he was sort of trapped by his fame at this point and what i love about steve martin is he saw this project and wanted to do it and took it really seriously learned tap dancing really devoted himself to doing this big weird musical and i i think it's it's fascinating that a studio let it happen maybe that's just a testament to how famous he was but this was never going to work no there's there's no universe where this movie which is it i think you make a good point because this movie is an unbelievably tough sell Mm -hmm. coming out in the early 80s with uh exclusively uh, show tunes from the 30s and 40s, like the vaudeville era, and um, no actual singing. Even though you cast uh, Broadway darling Bernadette Peters, there's one actual sung musical number towards the end that Steve Martin actually sings. But other than that, it's lip synced, uh, like magical realist style musical numbers, and. It's a it's a convoluted plot that's kind of dark. It's very dark. And <laughs> yeah. Um and Steve Martin's not being funny. No, he's not funny at all in this movie. And it's yeah, like that this movie got made is utterly baffling. All that to say this movie is a start to finish delight and uh easily one of the best movies we've watched this year and maybe period for this podcast. Yes. You know, I would agree with that for sure. Also, I don't know. We'll just note this year. Cause you got to put it somewhere. He was dating Bernadette Peters at the time. There were a couple, uh, when they made yep. this, but, uh, a couple of what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But yeah, I guess we haven't properly set it up. So to properly set it up, I mean, yeah, the movie takes place in the 1930s and he plays a character named Arthur who, uh, he sells, uh, sheet music. He's like a traveling salesman who sells sheet music. He's married to the lady from Suspiria and he's in a sad marriage with her where he is a very horny individual. And I was going to say he is horny as hell throughout this entire movie. Yeah. Like he starts horny. He literally, I think the opening scene is he's supposed to go on the road to start selling his uh, sheet music. And he tries to delay his trip to have sex with his wife in the morning and she is a very prudish character. And so they're a horrible match just in that regard. But she has money and that seems to be the selling point for him. But so he travels around. He meets Bernadette Peters, who is a school teacher who is as horny as he is. <laughs> and uh, he has an affair with her. She gets pregnant. And from there, both of their lives are just ruined in various ways. And and but all of it. The whole thing with the music and the way that it's a musical and, and Andy, as you were saying, is it has these standards, these old like 1930 standards that kind of break. For, so reality is very dark and drab and he's sad, but then they'll break into these big, lavish musical numbers where they're lip syncing to the songs. But they're like highly produced with lots of extras and dancing and amazing choreography and they very much feel like the golden age of movie musical style musical numbers. And I think this was kind of one of the last, if not the last movie on that scale, because it still has the scale of one of those movies in the 1980s. And it sort of is the end of all that, which honestly, I think that might answer your question as to how it got made. I think it got made because nostalgia has always been amazing fuel for Hollywood. And I think the, the temptation and the, the ability to kind of do this victory lap of your old big numbers and, and, you know, like I, I bet someone deluded themselves into thinking, no, people want (laughs) songs from 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, But it is, it's a fascinating thing. It's also, we should mention somewhere that it's based on a BBC mini series that, uh, Bob Haskins, Starring Bob Hoskins. Yeah, it was actually the star of um, which makes a lot of sense because I always picture him as a sad, horny man. So I think he was a little more on type. And he was a song and dance guy, too. 
Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, watch who framed Roger Rabbit when he he begr even as a character who hates tunes and who hates musicals, he still like manages to do a song and dance in uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit to save Roger's life. And he yeah, and um, but no, like this yeah, this movie is if if it wasn't so charming, like this movie treads a very thin line between brilliance and just utter nonsense and like the slight variance could have made this movie absolutely unwatchable and i think that's part of the magic of it well yeah and steve martin this has to be i think the least likable character he's ever played where it, he's really true in scrivella <laughs> i might even still be more charming <laughs> Like, my, OK, he might be more charming. Yeah, but that guy's a monster. No, that guy is a monster, but like sort of this fun monster, if that makes any sense. Like, it's a good character to play. This guy is just he's tough. He's really tough to deal with. It's tough to to like because he's simultaneously a sad sack and a dick. Well, right. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's his movie. So he is who we're following, but he makes a lot of decisions that you can't support and you kind of hate him for. And I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, just again, going to the idea that you can't root for the hero. Um, you kind of have sympathy for Bernadette Peters character, but you know, she's also kind of a mess. You know, there's not really a true antagonist. Christopher Walken shows up a little bit later on to kind of be, but like, so it doesn't follow a lot of those narrative beats. Plus, it's a weird ass musical like this movie has a lot happening in it. B but again, it's delightful, right? I guess we might as well do just just to fully set up the plot. So, yeah, he has the affair with Bernadette Peters. And before he meets her around the same time he meets her, he also meets a guy who is a traveling like accordion player who's a really weird guy who sing who is the guy who sings pennies from heaven he's actually who gives us that song but he's like really mean to the accordion player who's really broke and uh then he leaves him and continues traveling on and then there's a blind woman that steve martin meets and seems like he wants something to happen with but he just kind of interacts with her and then moves on but then the accordion player murders the blind woman, but a lot of forensic evidence from Steve Martin is left behind at the scene. And then his wife, the lady from Suspiria, ends up telling the cops things about how weird he's been acting, which lead them to believe that he is the murderer. And then the police are after him. And the movie ends with him like dying he get like he is going to be hanged he gets executed and then he has one last break from reality where it's a it's like no that's not how it ends it actually ends with this big musical number and then it does a musical number that is very clearly this dying man's like way to cope with his impending death and that's the end yeah this movie is dark as hell it really is I, by the way, I want to say something about it, and I, I'm curious if, if this occurred to you at all, because I love that we're doing it this month for this reason, and I love that his name is Arthur, because we started the month by talking about uh, Joker Folia Du. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to uh, pronounce it Joker with a Joker. Isn't that how it's pronounced? Isn't and it Joker? <laughs> Because he's not Joker. That's very clear. He's not the, the Batman canonical Joker. So he is Joker. Joker. There's a guy named Joe Kerr that murders Arthur Fleck at the end. Yeah. And uh, cuts his face. And uh, Le Quinn is uh, his romantic. <laughs> Le Quinn. Uh, but I, I thought of that movie when watching this movie again for the podcast because, one, that movie is a sequel to a film that people loved because the original ripped off uh, a good movie. And I really think if there was a way for Joker to work the sequel, it would have been to rip this off. I actually think this was the template 
for what that movie was trying to do, but that movie had no idea how to do it, which is if it was a movie about Arthur Fleck facing his inevitable going to be brought to the gallows and executed. And you basically just have him and Lady Gaga be Steve Martin and Bernadette Peters and just like, you know, have their break from reality where they sing standards like all of the pieces were there, but they weren't smart enough to put them together in the way that this movie did. But Todd Phillips is a dumb idiot. (laughs) He's a dumb baby. Yeah, he's a dumb baby man idiot. And I think that's the problem. So if he hadn't been a dumb baby, then he could have done this and that movie would have been better for it. No, it it would have worked. Um, I'm glad they didn't because I, I am on record as having hated both Joker movies. Same. And I love this. Yes. And also I would hate for it to get credit for this, a, a movie that uh, unlike, you know, King of comedy or, or whatever else, is in the DNA of the first one. This movie doesn't really get the credit that it deserves. So it would, it would actually be a shame for it to get credit for doing what this movie did better. And first. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I had similar thoughts. Uh, I try not to think about, but um, it did bring it up because they are cut from a similar cloth. It's just this movie does it with a sense of fun and delight that provides a nice juxtaposition to the darker content of the actual movie that uh, that Jorge Folie de just swings and misses on. Right. And I think a lot of if people go back and listen to that episode when we talked about it, the biggest problem in that episode in that movie is there isn't a clear we had a lot of discussions about like, I'm not even sure if he is singing or isn't singing. I'm not sure what reality is. And I think what this movie nails is there is a real world and we're always clear when we're in the real world and there is a fantasy song world and we're always clear when we're in the fantasy song world. And some of that is it's not them singing, you know, like, again, you you kind of alluded to it, but the at the end, Steve Martin sings Pennies from Heaven and that seems real. It seems like he actually is singing because he's those a, are his last words uh, in the gallows. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why we actually hear him sing there. And that's different from every other time we've heard anyone sing in the movie. No, it's abundantly clear. Uh, and it's not like he's just sitting there dissociating like this is like these are like instantaneous daydreams. But we see it fully play out of him, you know, singing these numbers. And it's a little weird that um, it happens even in scenes that Steve Martin isn't in. But it's just the rules of the world. So it kind of works. Right. Everyone has um, the fantasy. Everybody does the same thing. Right. Because there's um, even which. Yeah. The his wife, the lady from Suspiria, uh, she has a fantasy sequence that he actually asks her at the end of it. Like, what? Hey, what was it? What were you saying? Like where he's the one who doesn't know that someone else is like dissociating. So, yeah, it's just a world where everybody um, their break from reality. Because the clip we went at the beginning is. That's uh, Bernadette Peters and Christopher Walken, who we haven't talked about yet. Well, you you mentioned him, but like we haven't really I mean, that mentioned that he's in it, but we have not gone into detail about him now. Uh, but yeah, like that's just an amazing. And this is like a super early walk in role where I don't think people really knew who he was. And I really don't think anyone at this point knew that he could dance like that, where he just had those skills. Well, the deer hunter had come out, I think, at this. Point. Right. He does tap dance in the deer hunter. So that's true. Uh, there's yeah, that exactly. big, you know, like people don't remember that, but my favorite scene from the deer that hunter famous scene when the guns to his head and he does a, a tap dance number and then, yeah, he's doing it to distract everyone else. You are right though. The deer hunter came out before this, but, but I don't think people expected this from people him. People didn't know he was a song and dance guy. They thought he was a psychopath. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think maybe that's what I'm trying to say is like, he might've been a known entity, but the walk in that we're now more familiar with, which is weird guy. <laughs> Like people weren't really uh, clear on that yet. And I think this no, movie that, is a good indication. But yeah, and I mean, obviously, it's it's fairly common knowledge now um, that Christopher Walken had a long history of like working the vaudeville stage and being a Broadway performer and being a dancer and all that uh, before he started his run as just a weird psycho. Mm-hmm. Um, but this movie is sort of that weird almost non sequitur to most of his career from the seventies to the mid nineties ish. Um, 
really till the weapon of choice video, if we're being perfectly honest, his finest work, I think. Yeah. Um, and but yeah, it's and he's a fantastic dancer. No, he is. He's he's very good. I think like Steve Martin does a good job in this movie, having learned tap dancing for this movie. But it's it, Walken has that thing. And it's it's something that I, I think about now, because like sometimes you get like La La Land or something. And people now you get people who have varying degrees of dancing. But the thing that nobody has now is that life where when you were a child you had to learn these skills and you need it like to be fred astaire to be gene kelly to be someone like that you had to start to dancing Ginger rogers to be yeah, yeah all those people but like you can't nobody now who's an actor who's doing a movie can be as good as them because those people it is just part of their dna because they learned it at such a young age and had to do it so many times over and over again well, yeah, the idea of someone being a true triple threat nowadays, as they used to say, to be able to sing, dance and act just it's not the same. Even the people that are fairly talented at multiple areas, like it's just not to the degree. Well, and dancing is different now. You don't have to learn tap dancing now. Like you can no. have a long career as a very good dancer and not know how to tap, obviously. But like that, that's something yes. Walken's doing on the bar is a is a lost art in some ways <laughs> these days. Yeah, that's that is true. Uh, so one of the things that I texted you while we were watching this movie is. If they had actually sung the numbers, it wouldn't have worked. It worked because they were lip syncing. Yeah, I think they had to like, I, they, yeah, you said that to me. And I, I think that is true that it would have lost something. I, it helps sell. I, I think the artificial reality, I think. Yeah, Um. And I think my, I think my favorite and I mean, I, we're basically like not even splitting this episode. This is just full on silver linings, I think. No, I think we covered um, it. I think my favorite. I was just going to we covered it in the first five minutes. This movie was never going to work for the reasons that we said, but it's delightful. We're not maligning it like it's good. Yeah, no, yes. no, 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 no. Um, I think my favorite of the dance, the uh, musical sequences is Bernadette Peters solo number in her classroom. It's great. Um, There's so many good ones. It's tough to pick, but. Um, but yeah, like she's, you know, teaching a lesson. She's a school teacher to like third graders or whatever. And then it immediately cuts to like a stark white set, sort of reminiscent of the Cab Calloway number from Blues Brothers, where everyone is immediately in their absolute finest finery. And the kids are wearing short pant tuxedos, which are just dope as hell. Baller and, look for kids. Yeah. And like just an amazing like double bass groove and. Um, it's just so much fun uh, to do all that. And among a many other like really great numbers I and mean, both the pennies from heaven and the reprise are great. Uh, the vaudeville number is really good that Steve Martin and his two buddies do. And there's just there's a lot of really great moments in this. And Christopher Walken's uh, dance tirade are all phenomenal with that giant chest tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. The Lulu it's tattoo at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. for me, like walk in, it's the best dance number. So if that's what you're looking for. Oh, yeah. But no, the kids in the tuxedos are great. Yeah. The guy just singing pennies from heaven, the the murderer singing it the first time in the rain is really cool. Uh, that one works really well. Like I, I, they're all great. I like the the dance number with Steve Martin in the bank, which is kind of what sells yeah. it early on. And it's the first really big number with a lot of extras who are dancers and because he's asking for a bank loan so he can keep selling his uh, sheet music and they they laugh him out of there. But then he imagines them giving him the money. Right. Um. Yeah, this movie is. Uh, it's it's so weird mm -hmm. and it's it's baffling that it exists, Um, but I keep coming back to that idea that like and. This movie could have been so terrible. Yes. Like, I think you really have to understand that, like, is this a great movie? I don't know. I really liked it. But is it like great? Probably not. To, you know, your mileage may vary. But the fact that it exists and works is. I think the most impressive thing about it, because it shouldn't. <laughs> no. Yeah. All of that. I also it um like. I want to watch the miniseries. I haven't seen it, 
Uh, and there is some weird stuff yeah, where I've not seen it either. It, there, there is some weird stuff where like to, when they made the movie for a long time, they I think it was like a decade. They they had to they weren't allowed to air the miniseries for like a decade. Yeah, there's some weird. But um, but I will say I want to see it. And, and obviously, uh, you know, like I, I'm very curious about it. And I think it probably has more time to explore because some of what you said about the plot. I think is that they're condensing a miniseries down into a movie. So a lot has to happen in a short amount of time, but sure. I I think the advantage that this has, I imagine if I go and watch the other one is that this has money that it shouldn't have to do the dance numbers. And I can't imagine that the BBC like version of this has that many extras dancing that it has like a line of chorus girls dancing and that they spent the money like this movie had to be expensive to make. And I can't imagine they matched that budget for the miniseries. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see because I mean, there's some really amazing work that the BBC has done. Uh, but there's also some of those 70s Doctor Who episodes that are are very shoestring budget, you know, so it, it, it's it's kind of a crapshoot where it could be. You know, like uh, the movie Threads, which is the super dark uh, anti-nuclear war movie that the BBC did in 1984 that is scarring, uh, for lack of a better word. Like it is it is a tough watch. It's phenomenal, though. And like the budget is amazing and all that. But then there's also other things that don't have that budget. Right. Uh, Also, I'm just going to stick this here because why not? But. A huge silver lining for this movie is this quote from Steve Martin that you texted to me that uh, I had seen as well. But it, it's it's it, the most I think you said this It's the most Steve Martin quote ever. But he said, I'm disappointed that it didn't open as a blockbuster and I don't know what's to blame other than it's me and not a comedy. I must say that the people who get the movie in general have been wise and intelligent. The people who don't get it are ignorant scum. If you don't know what Steve Martin's deal is, that quote tells you everything you need to know about his sensibilities as a comedian. Um, it informs like the writing he did, like the plays that he wrote, the short, the novellas that he wrote are all in very much that vein. Born Standing Up is basically a 211 page version of that quote. Yes. Yeah. Which I just we've done some Steve Martin stuff on on the thing, and I probably have said versions of this, but I just to say it again, because I can never say it enough. Truly one of my comedy heroes and someone who shaped my idea of what is funny, maybe more than anyone else, like just that deadpan, hilarious Steve Martin humor is my favorite thing in the world. And I'm like, I'm such a big fan of him. And I also just love him as an artist that he did this movie because he had to have had a lot of people telling him not to do it. Like the, I guarantee someone had a bag of money with jerk two written on the side of it that he easily could have cashed in. He could, I'm sure they wanted another studio movie like this. And it's only because he had to personally want to do this, that he's in this movie. Well, and I think it speaks to how well this movie worked too is that it wasn't yes men telling him that it's a good idea a la Jack and Jill. Right. You know, um, that, you know, a comedian at the top of their popularity does something just god awful because people are telling him it's a good idea. No, this was like you felt his passion for it because he is doing such a genuine impression of like a Frank Capra, Jimmy Stewart style lead. And, you know, It showed what a great actor he is, too, that he's able to carry it, that he's not just those wild and crazy guys, you know, that he can do so much more than that. Um, But no, it like. If you're essentially like a Gen X millennial cusper or younger Steve and you're a comedy fan, Steve Martin is one of your comedy heroes. Like he is indelible to the comedy makeup of the 70s and 80s. Um. You know, and it whether it's the stuff on SNL, whether it's his his comedy albums, uh, Three Amigos, you know, whatever the jerk, whatever it might be, um, planes, trains, and automobiles, like he's just, and it's because he's willing to be vulnerable, 
but have his character not realize he's vulnerable. It's this weird line that he's one of the only people that's able to do it. Yes. Yeah. Um, that like, and I think it's why also he works so well with Martin Short because Martin Short is utterly impervious. And I don't mean that as an, as a compliment. Right. Yeah. But then you have Steve Martin that is absolutely able to be a doofus, but not realize he's a doofus. And it's, there aren't many, if any, like John Cleese is maybe in that rarefied air. And there's a few others that can kind of pull it off, but it's an incredibly short list that uh, he is definitely at the forefront of. I think it's just yeah, something just hit me that that I don't know. Maybe someone else has said this, but I think Steve Martin, his persona, his public persona is a bit like he's a human Muppet where in the way that the Muppets, their secret sauce is that they all have a lot of heart, but they're bad at the thing that they do. But nobody tells them that they're bad at it. Like Fozzie Bear's a terrible comedian, but he's lovable. And we like that he's bad at it because he's really confident. In his comedy, like I actually think that's this. Right, Gonzo is a terrible stunt man, but he's so committed to doing these stunts that are ridiculous. And it's yeah. it's the hubris that that is what's so lovely. And I think that's what Steve Martin excels at is hubris. All of his characters kind of have this like unearned confidence, and and I think that is what's really magical about him. And yeah, the fact that he can he has that gift where he can say terrible things and you still like him. And I think this movie actually really relies on that because normally that's played for a joke and it's like, you still laugh at the guy, but this one, again, there aren't jokes. So the guy sucks No, And it's, it's sort of like a Walter white kind of thing where you have to just like him enough to stick in with the movie because this guy sucks and everything he does is terrible. And his life is sad and stupid and like everything he does is wrong and he just hurts people. Well, yeah. Cause I mean, you watch him corrupt Bernadette Peters, who is very chaste. Like the opening of that bar scene, she goes into the, this really seedy bar and orders a lemonade. Yes. Yeah. Which is just like, I think really is one of those things that really encapsulates what her character is all about. Um, but then, you know, within the, Within, I think the next sequence after that, she's now a prostitute and she and Steve Martin get together. And it's it's like a really sad, like Tennessee Williams esque existence at that point. Well, and I think it's it, what's interesting about the movie. and What's fascinating about the dynamic is, yeah. So Steve Martin's thing is he's married, but he's again, as we said, he's like super horny. He has these unfulfilled sexual desires and when he meets Bernadette Peters, what's really interesting about her character, and I actually don't think we've talked about her enough, is that no. she is his equal. Everything he's into, there's literally like a scene that's really like this mirroring that's done where he tells his wife this story about how he heard that a couple paid an elevator operator so that they could have sex in an elevator, which is weird and nothing. And who wants to have sex in an elevator? But it, like it, he's super into it. And his wife is like, oh, my God, that's horrible. And then he tells Bernadette Peters and she's like, yeah, I get it. I would do that. And it's like they are these like peas in a pot. They both have the same desires. And what's fascinating about her character is like she was a school teacher. She was in the small town. She was minding her own business. And she had managed to like compartmentalize and she would have been fine if she never met Steve Martin. She would have lived a life where she was like kind of quietly unfulfilled, but otherwise okay as a respectable member of her town. And all this stuff with her becoming a sex worker and her like, you know, being like further corrupted by Christopher Walken and all that is because Arthur gets what he wants from her. He gets her pregnant and then he keeps going back and forth between her and his wife. He'll feel guilty and he'll go back to his wife And then he'll want to end things. But then Bernadette Peters is, you know, uh, to use the parlance of the 1930s down to clown. And so (laughs) like, you know, then he goes back to her and he keeps like stringing two women along. And it's what's fascinating and heartbreaking about the movie is like there is like I think literally Bernadette Peters kind of says the thesis of the movie, which is like a guy like you will never be happy because he can't ever pick a life that actually works for him. And he is the biggest problem in his own life and he can't get out of his own way. Yeah. He, 
goes through the movie like slowly self-sabotaging um, and never doing anything so egregious. And it's almost like karmic comeuppance that he gets accused and convicted of this murder and that he's just a shitty person. Right. Well, which isn't in and of itself a crime. Well, but. but it is. Yeah, it is very karmic because it's like the reasons he gets accused are one. He was being kind of creepy to the blind girl and did interact with her. So they found his his footprint and they found his fingerprints and they found all this evidence that he was there because he was there. He was talking to her. He shouldn't have been Two, the person who does kill her is someone who is desperate that he like kind of taunted and was like oh you're so broke and sad and like he's a jerk to that guy and like he pushes that guy even further and three the reason that his wife believes that he killed the guy and the reason she turns him over to the police which is ultimately what gets him arrested is because he's been acting weird and lying to her and she knows that he's hiding yeah. something and so when they're like well we think he murdered this woman she's like okay yeah actually that timeline makes sense because he came home the night of the murder and said, like, I can't keep doing this. I'm so ashamed. I want to be, be better, which he did. And he, he did it because the girl died, but because he found out that she died, not because he killed her. Yeah, it's. Um, and again, this is all interspersed with the cheeriest of Broadway standards from the 1930s. Well, and the whole thing with Arthur, the reason that he sells sheet music is because he, he is obsessed with the reality of musicals that he thinks like, right. Why can't I live in these old musicals? That's, that's the world I want to be in. Everybody in those movies is happy. And I want that. And I don't understand why I don't have it. And he doesn't get that. Like you're the reason you don't have it. <laughs> No, and I think that's another thing is that I don't know that there's another actor at the time now ever that could have made it work the way Steve Martin did. No, no, I think it would have played even with like uh, Hoskins, it would have played differently. Like, I, I imagine it's a different thing with him because Hock, I bet with Hoskins because he has a gruff exterior to put it mildly. <laughs> yes, that. um that it's probably even a bigger just juxtaposition, almost like when Eddie Valiant breaks into the song in Roger Rabbit, that it probably feels more like that is just a hunch on my behalf, on my part. Um, but yeah, that like even like a likable, like a, you know, like a Jimmy Stewart is too serious. Tom Hanks, I don't think would be believable lip syncing. You know, like when you think about like some of those people that have that. So, nice guy quality to them. Sorry, now I'm just distracted because in my head all I can think is, Mary, Mary, you want to have sex in an elevator? I'll get you an elevator. I, I, I paid the I, I, I paid the elevator operator to look the other way, and I just I gave it to her. I gave it to her over and over again. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you put some lipstick on your nipples? It really turn me on. That's another, we haven't talked about that, but that's a thing that Steve Martin is into, apparently. Like, his character, yes. Arthur. Is, he really wants the lady from Suspiria. I really should learn her name, but she's the lady from Suspiria. She's the lady from Suspiria. Yeah. You're in Giallo horror movies, and you don't want to have sex with me. I don't get it. <laughs> You're in those Giallos. That's how he says it. <laughs> yeah. Those Giallo pictures. <laughs> yeah. Kill you with some rope. Why don't you give me the money to sell my sheet music, you old savings and loan? Thank you. <laughs> Did you hear that, Clarence? She's into it. She's into public displays of sex. <laughs> Come on, Clarence, pull the emergency lever. <laughs> Every time an elevator floor bell rings, I go ring a ding ding. I mean, elevator sex has to be terrible, right? Like, it can't be any good at all. I, I like yeah it's i almost get it paying the elevator operator to look the other way because that's just weird yeah well and at the time you had the, the elevator operator has to be there so like if you're gonna have right. sex in the elevator like he has to be involved that maybe it's the novelty of the elevator that's part of it back then i guess um yeah but no, like it, it can't be comfortable. Elevators are cold floors and 
gross. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I don't believe that you would be living it up as you're going down. Like, I actually think that Steven Tyler lied to us all. Like, I, I don't think it's good. The only time that Steven Tyler ever lied to us. Cause that dude looked like a lady. Yeah. I mean, the famously that's the plot of Mrs. Doubtfire and that's what that song right. is played in. So yeah. And Janie had a gun. That is a fact, indisputable fact that Janie had a gun. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, th- uh, this movie is so worth it. It's so worth your time. It's a paltry 147 minutes. No, no, an hour, 47 minutes. No, it is. It's, it's worth it to watch the full version of that Christopher Walken dance that we played at the beginning. It's worth it. Just if you're like a Steve Martin completionist or like, you know, you, you know, some of this stuff or a fan or fan, like also Steve Martin loves this. If that helps you that like, this is a movie that Steve Martin thinks that you should watch of his. Uh, and he's right. You should. Uh, Cause it's not like cheaper by the dozens. We also, we kind of glossed over that, but like, I love Steve Martin so dearly, but the nineties were a, a dry time. He also remade the pink Panther. He remade the pink Panther. He really, didn't he do a Sergeant Bilko? He had a really bad 1990s. He did a Sergeant Bilko. Yeah. It, but we forgive him. We love the man. In, Looney Tunes back in action. Was he in Looney Tunes back in action? Wow. How have we not done that yet? That's gotta be done on this show at some point. At some, we'll find a way. It's 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 got to be a thing. Um, yeah, Steve Martin has a very uneven filmography, but his hits As do are a hits. lot of great comedians. But the the bangers are bangers with Steve Martin. And again, I truly do love that we're currently living in this renaissance for Steve Martin, where he is on a hit television show with Martin short and it's good. It's a show that I like, you know, like it's, and yeah, that he created, and he's good in it. Yeah. He's good in it. Like all the characters are great. And yeah, it's like a, he co-created it. It's a, yeah. Like God bless Steve Martin. Yeah. If, if there's one takeaway from this week, it's God bless Steve Martin. And God bless you, you old horny elevator operator. <laughs> You could have a great career, and you should. Yes, you should. Only one thing stops you, dear. You're too good. Too damn good. If you want a future, darling, why don't you get a past? Cause that fatal moment's coming at last. We're all alone, no chaperone can get our number. The world's in slumber, let's misbehave. Something wild about you, child, that's so contagious. Let's be outrageous. Let's misbehave. When Adam won Eve's hand, he wouldn't stand for teasing. He didn't care about those apples out of season. They say the spring means just one thing to little love birds. We're not above birds. Let's misbehave. Let's misbehave. Let's misbehave. If you'd be just so sweet and only meet your fate, dear, it would be the great event of 1928, dear. <laughs> Thank you.
Silver Linings Playback is a production of Hobotrashcan.com. If you enjoyed the show, please rate or review it on Apple Podcasts. Hear more great shows on the Peak Sloth Podcast Network.